Hi, my name is Travis Osterman. I'm a medical oncologist and informatician at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. I want to thank the meeting organizers and the National Academies for an invitation today to come and talk about today's patient portal and sharing patient data across EHR systems for cancer care and research. Today's patient portal looks very differently than the patient portal of even just two or three years ago. And patient, by patient portal, I mean here the mobile application or website that patients use to access their medical record from a healthcare system. In the past, that's usually meant a very small piece of the medical record or a redacted view. But April 5th, 2021 saw the final rollout of the 21st Century Cures Act, including the provisions addressing information blocking. And with this, we saw a big migration in healthcare where much of the healthcare record was immediately available to patients by law. Two big pieces of this are notes, clinic notes, which are immediately available, and then also results. And when I say results here, I mean uh, laboratory values, biopsy results, and imaging. So how have we reacted to this almost one year later? <clears throat> I really like this editorial from Dr. Tempero from UCSF and JNCCN, where she describes her views um, just as this was rolling out. I've summarized some of her recommendations for how this impacts patients and practices and, and what we can do. And I think I've incorporated some of these into my practice, certainly, and I've added a few uh, of my own to the list here. Um, so number one, I think that um, many of us uh, are attempting to reduce uh, abbreviations and here specifically, we're talking about ambiguous abbreviations, things like um, spelling out shortness of breath uh, or using the word dyspnea instead of SOB, uh, which when taken outside of the medical context um, might be misconstrued. Um, sticking to the facts in our notes and not, uh, not speculating or interjecting any sort of opinion um, or reminding ourselves to think about a patient reading the record. It's always been the case that this is the patient's record. They could always have the right to uh, receive that record and go and request it from medical records. Um, there's been a decrease, though, in the barrier to do that because those can be now seen very easily in, again, in patient portals. Um, and then on the results side, patients have a lot of anxiety uh, that uh, results are immediately available. Things like biopsies and radiation or radiology reports can show progression of their disease. Um, and we need to act timely in a timely fashion to discuss those findings with patients, um, but maybe even more importantly, set expectations on what that timeline looks like. And so this has become now a part of my practice, which is uh, when those results, um, when I'm in that when I'm in that patient room and uh, talking about ordering a biopsy or a CT scan, I'm thinking about what the expectation would be for when I call that patient with the result or when I'll have that information available and, and be available to that patient to discuss any findings. Um, so I think these are all pieces that many of us have started to incorporate into our normal practice. The 21st Century Cures Act also saw um, one other uh, big push, and that is uh, HHS, which finalized um, FIRE as the uh, recommended um, connection to electronic health record data. <clears throat> so the underlying health record can, uh, can certainly change even between vendor systems. The underlying data model may not be entirely the same, but the fast healthcare interoperability resources or FIRE layer acts as uh, an abstraction method on top of that data model and allows ap applications to be developed that connect to the FIRE profiles um, instead of directly to the medical record system. That means those applications can be interoperable between healthcare systems and really unlocks um, a lot of economy of scale. It also means that data that are extracted via FIRE from one healthcare system can be extracted via other healthcare systems um, for that same end. Fire is a big step in the right direction. However, it's not perfect. And so here's a, a cartoon of a 65-year-old woman with recently diagnosed breast cancer and an example of data that might be accessible currently via um, fire-enabled interoperability uh, standards in your electronic health record. And some of those elements that aren't. And 
to address some of these gaps, um, a group of us undertook a project that was announced at the 2019 ASCO annual meeting, uh, MCODER, the Minimal Common Oncology Data Elements. This is a project that was under the leadership of Monica Bertinelli, who continues to, to lead this effort. And this is a fire-based core set of common data elements um, that's really intended to serve as a data standard for patients with cancer that describes the state of the patient, and their disease, and their cancer journey in a way that we can answer meaningful questions in oncology. Um, we've tried to leverage standard ontologies whenever possible and then fill in gaps for things like disease status when um, other uh, other terminologies and vocabularies fall just short of describing again that cancer patient. This is an HL7 data standard, and currently we're in um, the standard for trial use number two. You can see that uh, the goal here is to describe these data um, and make them available really for any group. Um, some of those are included here, including making those data available to researchers, to patients, providers, um, even to registries, uh, payers, for example, for um, uh, prior authorization, et cetera. There are six domains within MCODE, disease, outcome, genomics, treatment, patient, and assessment. And in each of those domains, we have a number of data elements. And this is the high-level overview of those data elements, which number right around 100 in total. Um, these data elements, again, are intended to be the minimal set to describe that cancer patient and their journey. Um, and we've had a number of uh, groups working to implement this in a variety of systems, both in the US and internationally. Um, this has been an effort, uh, uh, the community of practice um, and codex that has been uh, organized by MITRE, who's been an incredible partner in this initiative. And you can see from this infographic, the number of healthcare systems, payers, et cetera, that are participating in the MCODE community of practice, which again is a group that are coming together to help um, each other implement MCODE, um, learn from uh, successes and failures and continue to push this data standard forward. Um, their feedback informs the data model and continues uh, its evolution forward. So clearly the 21st Century Cures Act has impacted uh, both patient portals and some of the efforts around data interoperability. Uh, but I also want to take just a minute to talk about what I see as some of our challenges that remain. And so one of those challenges I want to highlight is the portability of complex data. And I want to highlight specifically the scenario of patients like I would typically see in clinic that might come in with an outside next generation sequencing report for their tumor in hand. And that's typically a piece of paper that lists those variants that may impact the availability of clinical trials or other standard of care um, for their treatment. Right now in, in our system and many others that is going to be scanned and will be um, loaded into the medical record system, but in a format where we won't be able to fire clinical decision support to identify that patient for clinical trials or to use other population management um, uh, reports uh, to make sure that that patient, if a new treatment, for instance, becomes approved in the next two or three years, um, that we're not able to find that patient easily for that to match them to that treatment. So I think we need to work on how we digest and especially make those kinds of data, especially the complex data, more portable between systems, um, including data that come in hand by the patient. Um, next, again, we've made tremendous progress in the patient data model side, being able to describe the patient with cancer um, in a computable way. Um, we've struggled though a little bit in doing the same thing um, with both guidelines and clinical trials. And what do I mean here? <clears throat> so if we had guidelines that um, could easily be described in a structured format, then it would be much easier to understand what a patient's next set of treatment options are and to understand when we're deviating from standards of care. This could help prior authorizations. This could help in a variety of different areas. And there are some groups that are looking at the idea of computable guidelines, but I do think we need to continue to move in this direction. And similarly, I think we need computable structured clinical trial inclusion and exclusion criteria 
so that we can best identify which trials are best for each of our patients at any given time. Um, this, I think, will be a, uh, a continue to be an area of, of research going forward. Again, we've made great progress on the patient data model side. If we knew similarly detailed information about clinical trials um, that, was, that did not require humans to go in and extract those data, um, I think that we would be able to make progress even faster in this space. And then finally, uh, all of these things require access to technology. And so we need programs that are patient facing to help bridge the gap when uh, patients don't feel comfortable with technology, either because of direct access, they can't um, afford internet access or access to mobile devices, um, et cetera. Or if it's a healthcare uh, literacy issue, um, we need to address all of those barriers to access to these platforms uh, so that we don't leave any patient behind as we continue to uh, push the boundaries of interoperability and uh, patient portals today. Um, with that, I will stop and happily take any questions during the Q&A session. Thank you.